So Habakkuk, we're going to be studying from chapter 1, verses 12, through chapter 2, verse 1. Um, but first of all, we have uh, to talk about last week. So we're going through this book expositionally, and every part of it builds on each other. So last week we looked at the first part of chapter 1, and essentially Habakkuk is in 600 B.C. He's a prophet who has nothing to say to the people. His name means to wrestle with God or to embrace God. And what he's doing is he's upset that Judah is being wicked. He's upset that Judah is being wicked, so he goes to the Lord and he says, Hey, God, why are you letting Judah get away with this stuff? They're being terrible. And we looked at the really terrible things Judah was doing, and it was not a good situation. And Habakkuk had every right to be anxious and to be upset and to be worried and to be angry and to go to God and say, Why are you letting these terrible things happen? And then God answers Habakkuk. But he doesn't give Habakkuk the answer that he wanted. God says, don't worry, Habakkuk. I've got it covered. Look over here. I'm raising up the Babylonians. Don't worry. They're terrible. They're swifter than horses, more ferocious than wolves. They celebrate all these evil gods of idolatry that encourage them to go do other things. And I'm raising them up. I've appointed them to judge you. And here, they're coming now, and they're going to go judge Israel for all their wicked deeds. And I hated to leave little Habakkuk there all week long while we had to wait to get into the next part of this verse. Because I feel like that's a terrible place to leave a guy. He's desperate. He's upset. He's rightfully worried about the state of his nation. And God says, no, don't worry. I'm sending some really wicked people to purge you, to persecute you, to take care of it. And that's why today's sermon is called A Terrible Answer. Because if I could sum up Habakkuk's response to what God just told him, that's his answer. God, that is a terrible answer. I don't like it. And I think you're making it worse, God. I don't think you're actually helping anything. Because as Habakkuk is being told that this evil nation is going to come judge evil, Habakkuk's initial response is his justice meter goes through the roof and he says, well, wait a minute. They're more wicked than we are. God, no. I wanted you to fix this, not like make it worse. So that's where Habakkuk is today. And so we're looking into Habakkuk's second prayer. We won't get to see God's response today. But what we do get to see is a picture of how Habakkuk is going to respond to God's terrible answer. Because God did not give Habakkuk the answer that Habakkuk wanted. It's an answer that is distressing to Habakkuk, and it's an answer that doesn't bring him any comfort at all. And now Habakkuk is doing the right thing. He's taking it all back to the Lord in prayer. But now he's even more upset than he was before. And that's where we find our poor prophet today in verse 12 of chapter 1. In verses 15 through 17... Some translations will say the Chaldeans. Some translations will say the Babylonians. These are the same people. Assyria was the world power at this time, but Assyria was going to start heading downhill soon. And what's happening is it was a surprise to Habakkuk that God said he was raising up the Babylonians because no one expected trouble out of the Babylonians. They were just a little nation over there doing their thing. Nobody worried about them. They were about to be worried about. They were about to be another world power, and they were about to take over Judah. And so God says, no, I'm doing something here. But these are, these are very wicked people. And so if we look right here, it says, The Chaldeans pull all of them up, that's man like a fish of the sea, in their dragnet, and gather them in their fishing net. You can actually go to the Middle East, and you can see pictures of the Babylonians and their conquests. And they literally took inspiration from the fishing nets of the day and developed human nets. And they would drag their nets along with the armies and they'd throw their prisoners in there. And then they'd attach the nets to the horses and the horses would pull giant net bags of prisoners behind them. And they'd torture them and they'd persecute them. These are not very nice people. They didn't treat their prisoners well. It says there, there's some idolatry here in verse 16. It tells us the Babylonians sacrificed to their drag net. Their drag net is one of their gods. They consider this drag net as giving them power as it captures all of these prisoners. They believe it's given them power. So they're now they're worshiping their drag net. And it says in the last part of verse 17, if you have to sum up this nation and you want to really get a picture of what they do, the last half of verse 17, they continually slaughter nations without mercy. They continually slaughter nations without mercy. And so these are the kind of people that God says he's raising up to judge Judah. Very wicked nation. Continually slaughtering without mercy. That's reminiscent of some things in 
our history, we can think back over some wars fought over, leaders who decided they were going to slaughter nations without mercy. We can look back and we can see those leaders and we, and we look back on them with, with uh, disgust. We're not happy about those parts of history. We're not happy about what those people did. And there are certain people in world history that continually slaughtered people without mercy and they, they receive a special place of a level of evil. We look at those people as the gold standard of evil. Like everyone knows if you call someone Hitler, you've just made a big insult because he slaughtered nations without mercy. That's the type of people that we're looking at here with the Babylonians. But what's worse here is that God knew how wicked they were. I think what's worse here and what makes Habakkuk even more distressed is God knew that already. Habakkuk in his prayer in this text is saying, God, they have this net and they grab these prisoners and they torture them and they slaughter without mercy. But God already knew that. Because if you recall in the first half of chapter 1, God said, I am raising up these Babylonians. They are a bitter, impetuous nation. They are fierce and they are terrifying. Habakkuk's not telling God anything new. I think that's even more frustrating for Habakkuk. God, don't you get it? They're wicked, like extra, extra wicked. What are you doing? And so, in verses 15 through 17, we're going to break down Habakkuk's prayer into three parts this morning. I'm not going to spend any more time in verses 15 or 17. We're just going to note that it's Habakkuk's moment of panic. All right, this is Habakkuk's little meltdown here. In verses 15 through 17, where he just cries out in extra exasperation. But Habakkuk's moment of meltdown in the middle of this prayer is hemmed in on each side with truth and with confidence. His meltdown is hemmed in on each side with truth and with confidence. We're going to look at the truth part first, and then we'll look at the confidence. So if we want to see the truth, I'd invite you to go over there with me to verses 12 through 13. And what we're going to see right here is that Habakkuk, we already discussed, he, he's a follower of God. We can see that from his heart. But now we can see that Habakkuk has good theology. And his good theology is going to produce fruit in his life. So what does Habakkuk say in verses 12, 13? Are you not from eternity, Yahweh my God? So look, he already knows that God is eternal. That's really important. There are people that will tell you that God has an end or that God has a beginning. But our Bibles teach that God is eternal. Habakkuk understands that. He understands the eternal nature of God. That God is not bound by time with a beginning and an end as you and I are. He continues on. He says, My Holy One, you will not die. You appointed them to execute judgment. My Holy One. He recognizes that God already is separate. God is pure. God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. Habakkuk has a decent idea of who God is. He has good theology. Theology meaning what we believe about God. All of us are theologians. Some of us are good ones. Some of us aren't as good. But we all need to be developing our theology and knowing what we believe about God. Habakkuk knows that God is eternal. He knows that God is holy, is separate, is set apart. And also down here it says, My rock, you destined them to punish us. Habakkuk knows God is in charge. Habakkuk knows that God is sovereign. And so when he looks at his theology, he has a God who is eternal, who is set apart and holy, and who is all-powerful. But that good theology doesn't just sit there. In fact, when we have good theology and we'll, we'll understand the doctrines of God, that produces fruit in our lives. And the first piece of fruit that I see in Habakkuk's life as I look at these verses, notice how he praises prayer. My God, my Holy One, my Rock. God isn't just an abstract thought to Habakkuk. This is personal. Habakkuk understands that there is a personal relationship with him and God that's happening here. It's my God. It's my rock. It's my holy one. God is his leader. God is better than him. And God is his foundation. He says, my rock. That has the idea that this is, this is the person that Habakkuk goes to for strength. This is Habakkuk's foundation. Habakkuk knows that this is what anchors him in the storm. This is my rock. This holy, eternal, all-powerful being is my rock. Also, we see some solid humility. And this is the tough one here because Habakkuk doesn't say, God, 
this is what I think you should do. God, this is what you should be doing. God, this is what you need to do. He just asks questions. He's like, God, you are this guy. Why are you doing it? But he doesn't impose or assert his own plans. Notice that Habakkuk is not drawing out battle plans for God and saying, listen, if you will smite that one dude I don't like in Judah, and you'll just stop the Babylonians, you can fix this before it gets too far. Habakkuk doesn't say any of those things. Habakkuk is 100% humble before God. And so his good theology has produced two fruits in his life. Number one, Habakkuk has a personal relationship with an all-powerful God. Because of his theology, he understands who God is. And so now he's got a foundation for when a storm comes. And it's also produced the fruit of humility in his life. Habakkuk is not a prideful, arrogant, strutting around guy. He realizes it's all about God and he's going to let God do what God does. But he's also perfectly right in his relationship to question God and ask God what's going on and communicate with God about it. And we see that he is communicating with God about it in the right manner. Sometimes... When you and I communicate with God, we do it in a manner that's prideful. Tell God what he's supposed to do, how we'd like to see him do it, what he needs to do, and what we have decided is right and wrong for God. And that's not okay. But then sometimes preachers will give folks a hard time for being angry or upset or worried or anxious. The Apostle Paul tells me that I can be anxious. I just got to work that out in my prayer life. I can be angry, but I got to work that out in my prayer life. I can be upset and I can be worried. Now, I can be confused. I just got to go work that out in my prayer life. That's exactly what Habakkuk's doing. He's taking his anxiety, his worry, his anger, his confusion, and he's running to God with it. And he's saying, this is how I feel, God. And it's not okay. And I need you to do something. What are you going to do, God? And then God gives him his answer. He says, God, I still don't like your answer, but what are you going to do? This is how I'm feeling. He's communicating because he has a personal relationship with God. God is his leader, God is better than him, but God is his sovereign rock and his foundation. Theology is important because it gives us hope in our darkness. I used to have a friend that used to say all the time, don't forget in the darkness what you do in the light. Well, we can look at Habakkuk and it's pretty clear that he's in a dark spot. He's not forgetting what he knew in the light and what he knew in the light is his good theology. This is why I tell you all the time, you got to read your Bibles and you got to pray. Because there's going to be some days where you're not going to be able to feel God being close to you. You're not going to feel his arms around you and his plan is going to make absolutely no sense to you. As you see in front of you, destruction or problems or tension or relationships going to a place that you're powerless to stop it. And in those moments, what the devil's going to want to do is he's going to want to trick us. And he's going to want to tell us lies about God. And the devil's going to sneak right in there. He's going to jump in your ear and he says, this bad thing is happening because God doesn't really love you. Or you know what? I bet God could have stopped it. He just, he just can't. God, God can't stop it. He wants to, but he can't. Maybe the devil's going to tell you another kind of lie where God, you're not worth enough to God for him to hear your prayers. God doesn't care enough about you to worry about what little old you was going through. And the devil's going to sneak in with all these lights when you're in a dark place. And what comes out to bring us to hope what brings us that foundation is our knowledge of God, our understanding of who God is, and that's where our good theology comes from. Because when the devil comes in and he whispers things like, God doesn't love you, you sing songs like, For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. And the devil's going to come in and he's going to say, God doesn't love you, and you're going to read Bible verses where God says, You're my special child and I've adopted you into my family, and no one's going to take you out of my hand. And God's going to say, Man, the devil's going to whisper in your ear. He's going to say, God doesn't care about little old you prayers. You're not worth it enough to God for him to hear. And then you're going to go back to your good theology. And it's going to say, God hears the fervent prayer of the righteous men. The people that walk in God's ways, God will hear them. Amen. Good theology provides us a hope when we're in darkness. And that's what we see Habakkuk reaching to as his first comfort. I don't know what triggers Habakkuk had. I don't know what was going on in Habakkuk's head. I don't know if Habakkuk lived in the 21st century, if he would start stress eating ice cream right now to solve his problems. I'm not sure what his coping mechanisms were, but I get to see the one coping mechanism that's the true one, the one that scripture tells us is good. First thing on Habakkuk's shelf, he doesn't reach for the ice cream, he reaches for his theology. He goes back to what he knows about God, who he knows God to be, and that's where he's going to find his comfort. Verse 14 is kind of odd. It doesn't fit in our three parts, really. 
I said there's three parts to this prayer. We've got his moment of meltdown. We've got truth, which we just covered, which is his theology and then his confidence. But then verse 14, I think, is just interesting. He says, you have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. And i got to explain this to you, right? Expository preaching, that means we unpack what the scriptures say. It means that I'm not up here telling you what I want you to know. I'm here telling you what this Bible says. When a Jew would refer to the fish of the sea, they're talking about a whole bunch of unclean animals in an unclean place. So if a Jew was to walk up to you and say, oh, you shrimp kebab, I'd say, well, the shrimp kebabs, I love shrimp kebabs, let's get one. But to a Jew in his time, 600 BC, this was an unclean animal. So you go up to someone and you call them a shrimp kebab, you just call them a rat. You just call them vermin. Habakkuk is looking at God and saying, you have made mankind like vermin, and they don't have any rulers. If I could translate his Jewish emotion into American language, I would say, God, you have made us like fish in a barrel for the Babylonians. Is essentially what he's telling God. He's taking an accusation of responsibility and firmly pressing it at God. You made us, you put us in this situation, and you can fix it, and it's all your responsibility. That's actually fantastic. And there's people that will get squirrely with you. And their theology of the sovereignty of God will start getting a little wavering when the bad things happen. And they'll say, man, I see this horrible thing. And you're right. Maybe God doesn't love us. Why would a loving God let this happen? Or, or maybe God isn't all that powerful. Maybe he couldn't stop this. Well, see, my understanding of God's love and my understanding of sovereignty of God is not the measure by which his truth is. God is sovereign and God is loving because he said so and because he sets the standard. That God just doesn't exhibit sovereignty. God is sovereign. God doesn't just exhibit loving attributes. God is love. So when I get to a place where I'm sitting there and I'm wondering about things, I have every right, like Habakkuk, to take my situation and say, God, you made this, you did it, you allowed it, and it's your responsibility. But it's absolutely 100% okay to do with God. What's not okay to do with God is, God, I know you would have fixed it if you could. God, I know you would have taken care of this if you loved me, but it's all right. We'll just go rewrite our doctrine, and then we'll explain away the bad things in life. What I want you to understand is that sometimes our relationship with Jesus that I'm talking about all the time, sometimes it looks a lot more like Habakkuk crying out to God in his closet than it does David singing down the streets after winning a victorious battle. David had a relationship with God, and David won a battle, and he goes around and he sings and dances in the street, and his wife is like, what's wrong with you? And David's like, I love God, and I got to dance about it. And that's really cool. But there are a lot of days when your relationship with God will be a lot more like this. When you have to rely on your theology. And you have to know God. And it's so important that you have a right view of God is. And you can go to God with your anxiety, your worries, your fears, and your doubts. You can accuse God of being responsible for what's going on. Because He is. God is not the author of evil, but does He allow it? He absolutely does. Can God stop evil from ha happening? He absolutely can. So when evil happens, does that mean God chose to allow it and not to stop it? It absolutely does. But is God going to do something with that? Well, he absolutely is. Because another story you're going to find out in this Bible is that God brings a lot of glory to himself by redeeming broken human situations. God likes to get those situations to the place where you and I know that no man can ever fix it. No amount of human effort can fix this problem. Just God can fix it. In fact, bringing redemptive purposes out of hopeless situations is God's business. And this is also my gospel connect. And I'm going to shamelessly put you in the metaphor of a hopeless situation and say God did something good in that. No one? No one? God hasn't made a redeeming thing out of a hopeless situation in any of your lives? That's almost there. I said you were a hopeless situation and God did something good. Amen. If God saved us from sin, if Jesus died for our sin on the cross and saved us from an eternity in hell, we should dance around like Dave in the streets and be silly every once in a while. That's a good thing. We have a redeeming God. 
who looks at broken, helpless, sinful humans, and He shows His love to them and His grace and His mercy. Through nothing we can do, He just does it because He's God and He likes to redeem things. I said this was my Gospel Connect, and essentially Habakkuk is consistently asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, Romans tells me there's none righteous, no, not one, so there are no good people. And as R.C. Sproul likes to say, a bad thing only happened to a good person once, and he volunteered for it. It's found in 1 Peter 3.18, what we read for communion. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous for the unrighteous. That he might bring you to God after being put to death in the fleshly realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. See, this is the epitome of the gospel. This is the height of scripture right here where a bad thing happened to a good person and we benefited. Man, where's Keith? Someone's got to say hallelujah. Righteous. That's a good thing. And so now, you and I, the Bible tells us we're slaves to sin. We're slaves to corruption. All we can do is evil. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But then Jesus comes down and he lives the perfect life. He says, I'm going to be your sacrifice, your perfect spotless lamb. And I'm going to lay down my life for you because I love you. And now if you will repent from your sins, you will turn from that and you will follow me. I will fill you with the Holy Spirit. You will be born again. And then you can follow me. But you'll be reconciled to God. And now our unrighteous people can have a relationship with a righteous God because of one who took the fall. A bad thing happening to a good person is the epitome of the gospel. And all through scripture we'll think, see bad things happen to people that we think don't deserve it. But God loves to redeem those bad situations and do great things. There's a terrible answer to Habakkuk's original prayer. And after that terrible answer, Habakkuk has a moment of meltdown. That moment of meltdown is hemmed in by truth, which is his good theology. He understands who God is. It's also hemmed in by his confidence. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Habakkuk. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what he should reply about my complaint. Habakkuk is going to stand and he's going to watch. Sometimes you and I are going to go through a bad situation. We're going to see something dark and terrible. And the only thing we'll be able to do is be to give it to God and hold the line. That's what Habakkuk's doing. Habakkuk is not abandoning his post. He's not leaving his ministry. He's not doing anything he shouldn't do. He says, okay, God, you've got my complaint. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch to see what you'll answer me. And spoiler alert, God is going to answer him. And his answer is probably more satisfying than his previous two answers. But there is a big reward in here for Habakkuk. Who hems in his moment of meltdown with some truth, but then he also has confidence in who God is. And he says, God, I'm just going to stand here and I'm just going to wait. But I love this imagery here. He says, I'm going to stand at my guard post and station myself. There's an idea of attentiveness, of active watching. And I'm really reminded of the language in Psalm 73. I'm not going to read the entire psalm to you, but I'm going to read part of it. Psalm 73, starting in verse 12, says this. Look at them, the wicked. They are always at ease and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and I am punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless. So, does this sound a little bit like a Baptist situation? But I purified myself for nothing. Look at the wicked. There it is. I don't know what's going on. When I tried to understand, it seemed hopeless. But then verse 17 of Psalm 73. Until I entered God's sanctuary. And then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. What the psalmist says is, I couldn't make head nor tail out of this until I went into your house, and then I understood your purposes. Sometimes we're going to have to stop looking at the situation, and we're going to have to look to God. Some of the time, you should actually just say heresy. All the time, we should look at God and not look at the situation. 
all the time we should do that. Sometimes you're going to need to give to God and hold the line. And that's what Habakkuk's doing. And then I'm going to leave you with a little bit of encouragement here before we go. And then we're going to have to leave Habakkuk here standing on his watchtower until next week when God's going to reply again. But in Isaiah chapter 21, I want to leave you with this because the Lord doesn't leave Habakkuk there. Then the lookout reported, Lord, I stand on the watchtower all day and I stay at my post all night. So we're still on that watchtower. This is a prophecy about what's going to happen after Habakkuk. Look, riders come, horsemen and pairs, and he answered, saying, Babylon has fallen. Has fallen all the image of her gods have been shattered to the ground. Well, isn't that something? We get Habakkuk in here, and he's quoting a psalm about standing on the watchtower and figuring out God's purposes when he goes to the Lord about it. Then Habakkuk's here, and he's praying. He's in the middle of it. And he decides to stand on his watchtower and wait for God. And then what does the prophet say when Babylon ends up falling? The watchman was looking on his tower. And what did they say? Babylon has fallen. As a friend of mine likes to say, God's watch doesn't tick at the same rate as mine. God's timing is different than mine. God had a plan for Habakkuk. God wasn't surprised by what was happening. He had a different plan, and Habakkuk's job was simply to take it to the Lord in prayer, give it all to God, and rest on his knowledge of who God was, and stand watching the people.